Greetings, citizens of Nerdtropolis. Sean Todd here, the mayor of Nerdtropolis, and my guests today are Neil deGrasse Tyson and Scott Hamilton Kennedy. I'm floating. <laughs> I love y'all's backgrounds. I wish I could have matched y'all. I didn't get the memo. Oh, you didn't get the memo. That's yeah. right. But no one in the house. That's yeah, we got represent. I love that. We're space, <laughs> we're space themed today. Yes. Mm -hmm. There you go. Neil and Scott, it's great to chat with both of you and to discuss this documentary, Shot in the Arm. Uh, Scott, I must say congratulations on this exceptional work, uh, crafting this fantastic documentary. And uh, part of my profession, I consume so much movies and tv but they're all mainstream so mm. i was looking forward to watching an eye-opening documentary and boy i went through so many emotions watching this i'm not gonna lie uh it definitely i, I felt every part of it uh especially i, I lost my uh, grandfather in iran to covid uh, mm. complications so a lot of touching moments in this and so like i definitely felt a lot of emotions watching this and sean i've seen it 20 times i well up every time i see it i still well up and that's that's the storytelling uh, craft that Scott cares about and brings to what he creates. And Not I that I'm like his, you know, marketing arm here, but I would I would say that even if I weren't a participant in this project. And, and I don't want to stop either of you from complimenting me, <laughs> but but uh, but it is it is a it, and and obviously wanting to have an audience have an emotional reaction to your to to my to your film has been important to me through all five all five of my films. But this has been a unique experience because it chokes me up when I've introduced it, and I tried to figure out what it is. Obviously, because seeing my family in it and what we, we what we all lived through and survived, even in our very uh, kind of comfortable situation with we did not lose anybody and i'm so sorry for for personally didn't lose anybody i'm so sorry for your for your loss but it was and so it was that sadness of what we lived through but it was also the the potential of good that is deeply ingrained in the people involved so many of the good people involved in this film if it's the families in samoa that lost their babies from an mmr mistake and them not taking the bait on that and becoming cynical and saying, still, please get vaccinated. Or the doctors and nurses that stood up and withstood the slings and arrows. Or my beautiful wife continuing to teach these, these young people remotely. And then hearing sub stories of that, that these young people are choosing to, to maybe lose out a little bit on their education to teach their younger children. Right? These decisions, these humble human decisions to try to make our world a little bit better. That's what chokes me up. And his wife is not just a teacher anywhere. She's a teacher in Compton. Okay. So yeah. the, all these elements come together, I think, beautifully. And my role, I mean, I'm an astrophysicist, so I claim no special medical knowledge, but mm -hmm. I do have insights, I, I think, in terms of how people learn as an educator, how people think, how their brain wiring can help or interfere with how they receive information, how they process it, how they take ownership of a decision they might make. And so my dual role as script consultant and as executive producer helped to sort of shape the storytelling so that it has the, 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 the educational pedagogical dimension that it also needs to have. Otherwise it's just a, Otherwise, it's just let's just have feelings for ninety minutes. <laughs> you know, feelings are good. We love them. Yes, yes. Nobody acts without feelings. No. But we we, we got to put some meat on the bone in there somewhere. And and I I felt privileged to have access to this brilliant bit of storytelling to be able to give it all I can. Yeah, Neil. And so, when did you first hear about Scott's project? And then, why did you decide to be a part of it as well? Yeah, I you know I, I was minding my own business. Just I I didn't I'm not looking for this. All right, and uh, Scott, since we had collaborated on one of his earlier films, Food Evolution, in that film I narrated it, as well as offered some script and uh, advice. On this project, I've, I have a much larger role, uh, not only as script consultant but as executive producer it just started out rather simply he said neil how you doing i'm fine could you have a look at this um there was a two-hour edit that he had put together um and he sh shared with me the script of those two hours do i have any thought yeah i had a hundred thoughts and i sent them to him he didn't have a hundred actually but 
I'm just kidding. Okay, 50. It was a lot. It was yeah, like it's good. It was good. That's right. Yeah, it was it was a lot. It felt like a hundred, but you're right. Yeah. It's probably only 50. <laughs> and um it was uh he he heeded most of them. Others, it was because I didn't really see where he was coming from. And once that was explained or he adjusted the edit, that made it clear. But uh, so my role was basically to sharpen the pathways of communication. And as an educator, I those particular pathways, because you're trying to get inside the head of people who are misthinking mm. what would otherwise be an objective truth. Mm. And being an educator is not enough to fully address that. I needed my life experience in social media, in the public, in public talks, in all of these ways I have encounters with what are occasionally the tangled mental roadways of people's access to knowledge. And this is the, what I brought to the table. Yeah, what made me glued to this documentary was actually the inclusion of Dr. Peter Hotez, whom I see all the time on my local news channel out here in Houston. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm very familiar with him. So just seeing him in there, I was just even more in it um, because he's so trusted in our local community and globally. And so um, how is that to include all the great um, doctors and everyone else in this documentary like him? Oh, well, Peter's P Peter is uh, brave. He's smart. He's funny. He's humble. Um, and he also has the unique uh, point of view of having a daughter who is autistic. So a lot of the fear around vaccines comes back to one study, false study, fraudulent study, retracted study. I have to put all that in there. It's uh, from 1998 from Andrew Wakefield that tried to make a connection between the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, and autism. Complete, completely fraudulent. Hundreds of studies shown that it is wrong. And he wrote, a, Dr. Hotez wrote a book called uh, Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism, this beautiful, beautiful portrait of his wonderful daughter, daughter Rachel, and he allowed us to include that story in the film. So yes, Peter is, um, he's an icon in this, and he's really taking the slings and arrows uh, so courageously, and he <clears throat> underlines, as Neil does, the, the importance of, of the scientific method being taught, but he also underlines courage. It underlines that we need courage to stand up against some of these people who are truly bullies. Robert Kennedy Jr., for all the different problems I have with him, he's also a bully. He uses slurs instead of an argument. He, he, he uses uh, fear tactics, threats, all of these horrible things. And you have to be courageous because there's a lot of people that have quit. I've seen people in public health get burned out and quit and say, I don't want to touch this. I don't want to deal with it. People have said that about showing the film. I don't want to, I don't want to poke the bear. It's like the bear's been poked. We have to try and figure out a way to calm the bear or whatever, where, where we want to go with that metaphor, that it's not going to be avoiding it. Avoidance has not never worked. We have to face this problem. Yeah. And Scott, this, this first started, um, this, this documentary as a global measles epidemic, focusing on that. How did it evolve into the COVID-19 um, when the pandemic started and what challenges did you have making that shift um, for this documentary? Sure. Well, involved uh, very uh, shockingly, as all of us experienced COVID, we thought we had a pretty interesting film in measles and anti-vaxxers in, in 2019. And then COVID happened. And for a minute, we wondered if we still had a film, very briefly, because who, who, why is measles isn't going to mean anything anymore. Um, not as much. And uh, we saw, and as as Blima, Nurse Blima says in the film, there was a moment where many of us in the science believing community thought, well, maybe this 100-year pandemic might be the thing that brings some of this anti-science and disinformation to a halt. And we were completely wrong. It just got worse and worse. So the pivot came with needing to go from shooting live to shooting a lot of it uh, remotely. Thankfully, it went on so long that we, the filmmaking went on long enough that we got to go back and shoot interviews. Um, so the pivot was, how are we going to tell this story remotely? And what does it mean that we're seeing the disinformation around vaccines kind of marry to a disinformation around voting and really a, a, a movement of don't tell me what I want to believe is true isn't true. As the the, the, the back of a, a card in the film, you see it at a pro, an anti-lockdown protest and it has written in the back of it, your public, your health is not more important than my freedom. 
And it's just heartbreaking to see that something like that even needs to be communicated. And it goes to how a big, a big part of the film is really about how fragile our social contract is and how much it needs to be not just defended, but reset. Yeah, it tackles a wide range of topics on top of the, the COVID and, and the vaccine. Neil, can you explain what a vaccine does once it goes into the body? Well, I claim no special medical knowledge, but what I do know, of course, is that we as a species have the capacity to develop a, a, a we have the capacity to fight pathogens that enter our body. And unfortunately, there are some pathogens that will kill us before we have the opportunity to fight them successfully. And in this case, in the case of vaccines, of course, what they do is they they trick the body into building the defenses against the pathogen before the pathogen enters the body so that the day that actually happens, you are fully defended against it. So it's a way of building up a, 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 a protective wall for whatever is the pathogen we happen to know about in advance. And if you keep out the pathogen, you can delusionally think that you didn't need the vaccine at all. Mm -hmm. What do I need a vaccine? I don't see anyone catching it. Who am I going to catch it from? I haven't caught it. And I analogize that to the, the old one with, you know, why are you using a dandruff shampoo? You, you don't have dandruff. <laughs> That's the, so, so, and that point is made in the film, uh, vaccines with the modern sense that they're unnecessary are the victims of their own success. Mm -hmm. What the only way, you know, you know, vaccines are working when no one gets sick from what you're vaccinated against. So everybody just goes on with life just as normal. And so, yeah, it's, by the way, this, this immunity that you can get immunity by having the disease, right. but that's if you survive the disease. That's it. All right. That then you have immunity, but <laughs> with a vaccine, you get to survive the pathogen without dying as a result of it. That makes sense. And Scott, why does it appear though sometimes there's two polarized sides to the discussion? It's kind of like all in or none. Is there a balanced stance of of this? That's a that's a beautiful question. That really goes to the heart of uh, of this of the struggle. Of course, there is a balanced stance on these things. The question is, are we going to have the humility to? use tools to find the best way to go forward, right? Are we going to have the humility to say, just because I saw it on my social media feed, it might not be correct. Just because I feel passionately about it, it might not be <clears throat> be correct. Just because someone as effective a communicator as someone like Robert Kennedy Jr. has convinced me of something, it might not be correct. So the the balance only comes if we have the if we have the humility to check ourselves and use the scientific method and other tools to see what is the best path, not the perfect path. There's no perfect paths to go forward. The best path to go forward in each given um, situation. Yeah. By the way, the best path is um, that's, you know, scientifically that's quantitative. So mm -hmm. uh, is the vaccine hundred percent effective? No, it's 90% effective. All right. Um, are there complications from vaccines? Yes. The comp what percent of the total cases, right? So <laughs> There's nothing out there that is zero risk, right? So the question is, if you want to make an informed decision about what you put in your body, you look at the risks, all right? Um, if And what we found was that people were gravitating to these, these small risk factors saying, I don't even want to take that risk. They'd rather get the disease, risk dying, okay? By the way, the people, the anti-vaxxers who were interviewed on talk shows are the ones who didn't die, okay? <laughs> when you're dead, you don't do talk shows. And people who were not vaxxed were dying at five times the rate of people who were vaxxed. So these, and maybe we need more classes in statistics in school. 
so that we know how to think about probability and risk and decisions that we make for ourselves and for our loved ones. Yeah. And you just like ran right into one of my questions I had is teaching people how to read stats and results, even polls uh, and surveys. I feel like people don't understand um, how to under read those. In our recent lifetime, like last 20 years, maybe 25 years, um, polling data began to include uncertainties, uh, the margin of error, all right? Uh, and it's plus or minus 3% or 2%. And I thought, well, that's, a, that's good. That's a start. So you don't have people saying, oh, it's, we're half a percent above you, so therefore we're going to take... No, there's uncertainties in the measurements. Learn to know what they mean and how to interpret them. So yes, I would say more training in critical thinking, especially more training in statistical uh, interpretation of information. And without that, you know, I can't as an educator hit people on the head if they were never trained in that way. They're susceptible to charlatans who uh, would exploit their ignorance of statistics and critical thinking to get them to do whatever it is they want. Yeah, and th this documentary just offers so many pieces of information I didn't even know. Uh, Scott, after this is all out, what is next for you? What are you going to tackle after this? Well, it's funny that we, Neil and I have these backgrounds today. Uh, we've been talking a long time about a possible collaborate, another collaboration. Don't freak out, Neil. Um, uh, on a project that we have a working title of Alien to Me, is taking on the disinformation around yeah the disinformation <laughs> around ufos that is now for some God, reason i need a refractory period after this project <laughs> fair enough fair enough um the, the the disinformation that's out there around ufos and the fact that it's it's been out there for a long time but it really went to another level in 2017 when the new york times had a a cover story that was not just full of misinformation or imperfectly told stories or cherry picked. It was written by two people who are actual believers. And it was a shame that the that the New York Times actually didn't retract that or, or point that out. So yeah, there's another uh, defensive science story in there. And I've got many other others behind that, including uh, scripted as well. And by the way, it's not so much the defense of science, which it is, it's yeah. the defense of the methods and tools of science, yes. and how we invoke them to arrive in a, at an objective truth. And that can be applied in so many different ways. Yeah, that's exciting to hear. Uh, I love reading and watching anything alien related. So I'm excited for that next documentary. So thank you for sharing that with me. And I, I know the citizens of Nertropolis are gonna be excited for that documentary as well, being <laughs> sci-fi nerds as well. So thank you, Scott and Neil, this was excellent. And let's talk again when that documentary does come out. You got it. Put well, it's on your list, thanks. Thanks for the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, nerd power for sure. <laughs> nerd power. Once again, this is Sean Taj, the mayor of Nerdtropolis, and stay tuned for more movie news, reviews, interviews, and trailers.